Thanks very much, Farah, for reading the Bible. Good morning, friends. It's lovely to see you. My name is Tim. If we haven't met, welcome on this very special day. I'm really looking forward to baptizing five friends, five new followers of Jesus, um, just after we finish in here. Um, so it's, it's very, very special. Um, Yun, Max, Andy, Paul, Aaron. A special welcome to you all and to any family and friends who've come to see uh, this such special expression of trust in the Lord Jesus. Let's pray as we look at this part of God's Word. Father God, we thank you that you speak and that this is your word to us that you are saying right now. We pray that we would be excited to hear your voice in your word. So by your spirit, help us all to listen and to learn and to live lives worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I brought something special. Uh, it's a trophy. It's one of my it's my only trophy, actually. Um, but it's my trophy. Uh, there's a photo. You can see it's got my name on it. Okay? Junior Cross Country Champion, 1985, right? That's when I was 10 years old, uh, in year five. The Junior Cross Country, and I won. I won. All right? That's, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is my trophy, and it, and it, and it shows my glory. It has my name on it, and I'm proud of it. Actually, that was the fittest I've ever been in my whole life. It's all been downhill since then, uh, but I love my trophy. I'm tempted to spend the next 20 minutes telling you all about that race. I have not forgotten. It was a glorious moment, and this trophy shows my glory. It displays my glory before all of you. That's what trophies do. Uh, let me show you a picture of another trophy. Uh, that's Jonas Vingegaard, who won the 2022 Tour de France cycling race. And you can see there his trophy showing his glory, because that's what trophies do. What about God? What is God's trophy? If God was to hold up a trophy so that we could all see it, so that we could see his glory... What would it be, do you think? Let me give you a clue. Let me tell you two things that it isn't. God's trophy isn't some church building, a cathedral, or even a nice building like this one. That's not God's trophy showing his glory. It's not a building. Secondly, something else that it isn't. God's trophy isn't the sacrament which sometimes people hold up. No, friends, that is not God's trophy showing his glory. So what is it? Look around, friends. Look around. Actually, look around. Look at each other. Go. Turning heads. Let me see them. Turning heads. Look back at me. That is God's trophy. It's us. It's God's people. God's church, we are God's trophy, showing God's glory to all of the world, to all of the people of the world, and to the powers in heaven. It is us. Remember, friends, God's church isn't the building. God's church is the people in the building. Us, God's people, saved by Jesus. We are God's trophy Showing off his glory. It's in the passage, verse 10. Have a look at verse 10. For God's intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. We are God's trophy. And if we really get this, it will change us. Like Paul, the apostle, will be happy to serve and even suffer for this church. And like Paul, we will pray for this church. So let's have a look at the chapter under those two headings first. Paul is happy to suffer in serving God's church. You see, Paul is in jail. He's suffering. That's never fun. No one likes the limited freedoms of jail. 
And Paul's actually in jail because of his ministry. He's been sharing Jesus with people like these Gentiles in Ephesus. And that's how he begins, verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Paul's in prison. Paul's using his time well. He's praying for them. And it seems that he's about to tell them what he prays. But then he realizes that they may get discouraged as they remember that he's in jail. And he's in jail because of Jesus. He's in jail because he shared Jesus with them, the Ephesians. So maybe they'll get discouraged. Maybe they'll feel sorry for Paul. Maybe they'll be tempted to give up on the gospel because it causes suffering like jail. It's done that for Paul. Paul doesn't want that. So Paul talks about his ministry. That's verses 2 to 13. And then he gets back to his prayer in verses 4 to 19. And the big point that Paul makes as he talks about his ministry in verses 2 to 13 is that it's a privilege. It is a privilege to be a servant in God's church. You see, Paul's been able to reveal a mystery. The word mystery is used four times in these verses, and it just means secret. That's what it means. Paul is saying he's been able to reveal a special secret in the plans of God. I wonder, friends, if you've ever had a great secret that you've held on to and you've wanted to tell it. Can you think of a time like that? My mum tells of a time like that. I'm the eldest of three kids in our family. And my mum tells of the secret she held when she first found out that she was pregnant with me. That, that was special, right? That was a special secret that she held on to. And she couldn't tell any, anyone at the start. And she tells the story of riding across the Sydney Harbour Bridge on her little scooter, knowing that she was pregnant with me, and only her and my dad knew, and she wanted to tell the world. She wanted to scream it out to the world that someone pretty special was on the way. She, she, she wanted to reveal this secret. She had to keep it for a little while. It's hard to keep a secret. Paul is given the job of telling God's secret, of revealing it, of sharing it, of making it known. What a privilege. The Old Testament prophets spoke about the secret, but they didn't know the answer. Uh, Paul talks about that, about that in verse 4. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. So what, what is it? What's the answer to this secret? Verse 6, this mystery or secret is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and share us together in the promise in Christ Jesus. That is the answer to God's secret plan. We Gentiles are included in the gospel as well. God in the gospel would bless not only the Jews, but people from every nation, people like us as well. That is amazing. Remember, friends, Back in Paul's day, the Jews didn't talk to the Gentiles. Here's an inscription that's been found on a seat uh, in the ruins of a theatre in Miletus, just south of Ephesus, where Paul's writing to. And it says there in Greek, for Jews and God-fearers only. That is, Jews had their own special seats. The Gentiles couldn't sit in them. You Gentiles, sit over there. They didn't talk to each other. 
But God in Christ draws us all near. Near to God and near to each other. That's what the gospel does. It's amazing. This gospel, this message of the death and rising of Jesus, it builds God's glorious multi-ethnic church. And God's multi-ethnic church is glorious. There's nothing else like it, which is why it's God's trophy. It is spectacular. God's church, us, we are a trophy displaying God's wisdom to a watching world and to the heavenly powers. Verse 10 again, God's intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. God's wisdom is manifold. The word means multicolored or spectacular. It's like when you look through a kaleidoscope and you see something like that, a beautiful mix of colors. That's what God's wisdom is like, spectacular, kaleidoscopic. And we, God's people, united to God and united to each other, we are God's trophy showing off his kaleidoscopic wisdom to anyone who can see. None of it's because of us. It's all because of Jesus. Because that's how God's done it. Verse 11, it happened according to God's eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And friends, God has done this among us. God is doing this and has done this right here at Auburn Anglican Church and at Newington Anglican Church and at Auburn Night Church. God is building his glorious multi-ethnic church to display his glory in the gospel. Let me use one of my favorite toys in teaching about our church. I want you to imagine, friends, that uh, one of these little red um, diamonds here is someone from our church. So that there is uh, Yelena from Kazakhstan, and there's Chan from Korea, Miriam from Turkey, uh, Wilfred from Sri Lanka, Brianna from Kenya, Minnie from the Philippines, Will from Scotland is there, Vinnie from Brazil, Ace from South Africa, and there's Aaron, one of our friends we're just about to baptize a handful of people from our church, but all distant from each other, not really knowing each other. But then imagine that in the middle is God in Christ. And in Christ, God draws all these friends to himself. And as he does, he draws us all together as one, close in relationship with each other. That is what God is doing in the gospel. And nowhere else do you see it except from here in God's church. It is glorious. In Christ, we draw near to God. And in Christ, we draw near to each other. Do you see what a spectacular trophy God's church is? And friends, the point that Paul wants to make is this. Serving this gospel that builds this church, that's a gift. Suffering for this gospel that builds this church, that's a gift. Twice Paul uses the word grace to speak about his ministry. Verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me. Verse 8, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. Paul is saying, yes, I'm in jail, but don't feel sorry for me. 
Verse 13, don't be discouraged. It's because of Christ and his gospel that builds this spectacular church. Paul counts it a great privilege to serve and even suffer for God's church-building gospel. Do you think like that, friend? Do I think like that? Today is one of those encouraging days in the life of our church. It's a celebration. Praise God. It's not hard to be excited about God's church today. But there are days when it is hard, when it feels slow, and it feels ordinary. And there's opposition, and there's criticism, and we're tired, and we just feel discouraged, and we're tempted to give up. What will keep us going in God's church? It's knowing this. It's knowing what Paul knows, that we're playing a part in building God's glorious multi-ethnic church. One writer that I read made this reflection. The value we place on something determines the hardship we are willing to endure for it. We will expend enormous energy and resources to care for a person or a prized possession we value a great deal. Paul valued the gospel enough to go to prison for it. Do we value the gospel enough to endure hardship for it? Would we go to prison? The message of Christ is glorious. And the church it builds displays God's spectacular wisdom. It is a very great privilege for any of us to serve in God's church. It is a very great privilege for any of us to suffer for the sake of God's church. Friends, knowing the glory of God's church, not only will we serve it and suffer for it, we will pray for it. And that's where Paul gets to now. He's finished talking about his ministry. He's finished his detour. He comes back to his prayer. How does he pray for his readers? How do you pray for your church, for our church? Well, in verses 14 to 19, Paul prays two big prayers. In verses 16 to 17, Paul prays first that Christ would inhabit their hearts. Verses 16 and 17, I pray that out of his glorious riches, God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That word dwell is the word inhabit. It's a prayer that Christ would set up a permanent dwelling in their hearts. Christ already lives in them. They're Christians. We've seen that in Ephesians. But Paul is praying that Christ would settle in by faith into the very engine room of their lives, their hearts, so that he controls absolutely everything. That's the prayer. Think of a driving illustration. It's the prayer that Christ would move from being the passenger to the driver. We can be good at keeping Jesus as the passenger. You know, maybe we ask him for directions every now and then. But really we want Jesus to help us get to where we want to go. Paul is praying that Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith, that Christ would be in the driving seat, that Christ would take charge of the whole road trip of their lives, that Jesus would direct their relationships, their morality, their sexuality, their thought life, their work life, their dreams, their desires, and their decisions. Absolutely everything. That's the prayer. And this is hard. And so it needs prayer. So Paul prays for them that they would so trust Christ that they would bring Christ into the very engine room of their lives, into their hearts, and dwell there 
set up home there and direct their lives. Friends, pray for this. Pray this for me. Pray this for our church. We need prayer. That's the first prayer. Secondly, Paul prays that they would know Jesus' love better. Verses 17 to 19, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Notice, friends, Paul doesn't pray that they would love Jesus more. And that would be a good prayer to pray. But Paul prays something even better. That they would know more how much Jesus already loves them. You can't ever know that fully. Not in this life. Not until heaven. But you can get to know it better. And that's the prayer. That they would grow in their understanding of just how much Jesus loves them. Paul is praying that they'll be blown away by it. Moved by Christ's love. Melted by Christ's love. And that's Christian maturity, friends. What Paul means by being filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. How do we experience this? How does this happen? First, it's a shared experience. Paul prays that they would have power to know Christ's love together with all the Lord's holy people. We need each other. That's why it's so important that we come to church. You've come today. That is wonderful. Keep coming so that we help each other know the love of Christ. Keep coming, friends, each week. Secondly, we need prayer. We need to pray for each other that we'll know Christ's love more deeply. So pray it. Pray it for me and for us. Pray it for your family. Pray it for the families in our church. Pray it for your congregation. Pray it for the other congregations in our church that we would all know the unknowable love of Jesus better. I find Paul pretty inspiring. If I was in jail, I know what I'd be praying, that I'd get out. If I was in jail, I know what I'd be asking you to pray, that I get out. But Paul doesn't pray, uh, doesn't ask his readers to pray for his release. Paul prays for them that they would better know the very gospel that has put him in jail. It makes no sense. It makes no sense at all until you see the glory of God in the gospel building his spectacular church. Only then does it begin to make sense. A prayer like this. And friends, this is the future that we dream of for our church. We advertised today the big day in, talking about a future to imagine. What is the future that we imagine for our church? Some new building? Some new staff worker? Maybe a new congregation? These are great things to dream about and to plan for. We dream of something way greater. And it's this. It's what Paul prays in Ephesians. That we grasp more strongly what we already have in Christ to the glory of God. That is our dream and prayer. Christ already dwells within us. 
but we dream and pray that Christ would inhabit our hearts even more deeply so that he drives every part of our lives. We know that Christ loves us. We dream and pray that we would know Christ's love better, better and better and better. We are God's trophy, showing off his wisdom to the universe through Christ. We dream and pray that as Auburn Anglican Church, Newington Anglican Church, Auburn Night Church, that we would glorify God more and more and more. That is the future that we imagine for our church. Will you pray for it? Please do. Friends, we're going to, in just a moment, we're going to pray this prayer in Ephesians 3. I'm going to lead us in just a moment. But first, friends, a two-minute song for you to reflect on. It's straight out of the truth of Ephesians, and it finishes with this very prayer in Ephesians 3. So two minutes to reflect. The words are on the screen. And then I'll jump back up and lead us in that prayer. For this, I'm not fit for the task to craft words with adequate passion to match the size of grace beyond anything I could grasp. But it grabs hold of me, so I hold on tight and hug it back. Surrounded by grace that surpasses the past, beyond anything we could hope for or ask. How can words describe the word made flesh? The best way to understand him is to understand his death. What he set to accomplish and fulfill with every step. He was sent from the Father, God's gift to the world. Gave his only son to purchase sons and daughters to make us one with the son and one with the father took upon himself the condemnation we deserved resurrected after death and he promised to return filled us with the spirit to seal our election and protect us until the day that we share in his resurrection the size of grace how great the size the gates of heaven are open wide and people of all kind are welcome inside should have been denied but instead god replied he said in your place my son has died his death gave you life it's the size of grace innocent blood that was shed to erase every trace of sin for a chosen race it's the great exchange it's power to change the gospel salvation for all who believe all for his glory overcoming our hatred and sin with his divine love the love of our god gracious and kind god became a man and suffered for mankind the punishment for our sin was poured out on him so we could be forgiven and forever live saved by grace the cost was not cheap we can't add to it his work is complete the greatest gift we could ever receive is the gospel salvation for all who believe so we pray for strength with the power of his holy spirit so that christ may dwell in our hearts through faith that we would have the strength to comprehend together with all the saints the height depth and length the love of christ that surpasses knowledge filled with the fullness of god the size of grace we're gonna pray now join me friends let's pray father god we praise you for jesus and the gospel of grace we praise you that we get to be your trophy to the universe, displaying your wisdom in the gospel. So we pray now, Father God, that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. We pray that we, together with all your people, would know the height, depth, length and breadth of the love of Christ, that we may be filled to the measure of all your fullness. Now to you, our Father God, to you who can do more than all we ask or imagine according to your power that is at work within us, to you be glory in our church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, let's continue now to behold and adore our God seated on the throne. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs> 